reading to you from uh, uh, Hebrews 6 and 10. God is not unjust. He will not forget how hard you have worked for him and how you have shown your love to him by caring for other believers as you still do. Good evening, my dear listening friends. Again, this evangelist Cecil Moe. And as you know, I'm a converted alcoholic, gave my heart to Christ over 55 years ago in a pastor's home in Seattle, Washington. Then one year later, God called me to preach. Oh, friends, I didn't intend on being a preacher. But you know, there is a call. And believe it or not, there's a lot of pastors today in churches who are not called of God. Their mama called, her church called. But a real God-called preacher has a message every time he steps before people. Now, I'm an evangelist. I'm not a pastor. Now, evangelists has a, uh, don't have half the hard job that a pastor has. He goes in and he excites people and tells them about Jesus, wins souls. Then he goes on. But the pastor has to stay, teach. And if the pastor isn't teaching, he's not doing his job. And if a pastor is not visiting, he's not doing his job. And you look at the Bible, don't take my word. Listen, I'll be with you for half an hour tonight. Kick off your slippers, sit back and relax, pour you a glass of iced tea or a cup of coffee. Ah, oh, let's see what the Lord has for us, okay? Tonight, I'm going to speak on one of my favorite subjects, testimony. Oh, you better believe. And when you get done tonight, you'll say, well, you know, Cecil, that's exactly what I haven't been doing. And tonight, please, I'm not here to put you down or make you feel bad. I just want you to get the joy, the full joy of your walk with Jesus. There's nothing, beloved, more important that a Christian can do than testify of his Savior. Now, I'd like to take this scripture here found in uh, uh, Isaiah, the 12th chapter, and with the fourth verse. And in that day you will say, Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Make them remember that his name is exalted. Well, friends, now that's, that's an order. We are to tell people about Jesus. In the book of Acts, it says we are witnesses in the uttermost parts of the world, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judea, and the uttermost parts of the world. Well, where do we get the example that we need for testifying? Well, I'll tell you, one of the best ones is Saul of Tarsus when he was converted on the road to Damascus. Now, here's an evil, ugly man that was doing everything that he could to wipe out Christianity, beat up on Christians, put them in jail, see them stoned to death. He saw that. He saw Stephen stoned to death. He held his coat, in fact. But... One day he had a whole bunch of his thugs and they were headed down to, to uh, Damascus to get a few Christians and beat them up and kill them and do this and that. All of a sudden there appeared a great light out of heaven, knocked him to his knees. Oh, yeah, it did. And he heard a voice, Saul, Saul, why dost thou persecutest me? And Saul cried out, Lord, he knew who he was talking to about. He said, it's so hard to kick against the pricks. Well, Saul was doing everything in his flesh, and he was doing it in total ignorance. Ask him. He'll tell you. Total ignorance. Well, then God called him to preach. And he told him all the sufferings that he was going to have. And bless your heart, Paul of Tarsus, he suffered Oh, he suffered. He was shipwrecked. He was beaten. He was thrown in prison. In fact, the matter, it was in prison that he lost his head. But while he was there, instead of sitting and moaning and groaning like most of us Christians do on the pity pot, 
He witnessed daily. He was winning the guards. He was winning people because that was what God called him to do. He said, well, see, so wait a minute now. You're an evangelist. That's right. God called you in Seattle to preach. Yes, that's true. But God doesn't just call people preachers to witness for Christ. Anybody who takes the name of Jesus is commissioned to go into all the world and preach the gospel. Oh, yes, you are. You can thump your nose and you can jump up and down. You can curse me if you want. But you read the book and you'll find I'm telling you the truth. It tells us in Isaiah 6, 2, 6, On your walls, O Jerusalem, have appointed a watchman all day and all night. They will never keep silent. You who remind the Lord, take no rest for yourselves. How are we to witness? Unceasingly. Day in and day out. Now, there's a big joke with Bill Adelong and, and uh, Reverend uh, uh, Tex. He says, Cecil will go in the pulpit. He'll choose a text. And then, bingo, he takes off to his testimony. That's correct. That's no lie. When I go to prison, I... Tell them one thing, how I met Jesus. My wife tells me how she met Jesus. And our lives were altogether different. See, my wife lived a good life and went to church and Sunday school and had little pins on her because she was faithful. But she was as lost a goose in the grass. Why? Because she said, I am not a sinner. Now, the Bible says that we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God. Hey, I want to ask a question. Did you know that you can get paid for sin? Well, you sure can. The wages of sin is death. However, the gift of God is eternal life. Did you know that salvation? He gives it to you. He sure do. Oh, he does too. And you know what, tonight, you might be sitting there and saying, you know that Cecil, he is, he's dumber than a stick. But you know, he might be right. Because you know, I don't know where I'm going when I die. Well, you can know. Of course, if you don't know, you don't care about winning souls anyway, do you? But it tells us in Mark 5.18, And as he was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed was entreating him that he might accompany him. And he did not let him, but he said to him, Go home to your people and report to them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. Now, this demoniac was in bad shape. Man, he was in chains and he broke the chains and the Lord cast the demons out of him. Now, Jesus and his, uh, his entourage was going back to the ship to go somewhere else. And he looked around and here this demoniac was. He said, where do you think you're going? Oh, he said, Jesus, I want to follow you. And I can understand. Oh, I can understand how he felt. I want to follow you. But he said, son, you can do a far greater job if you go home and let them know what the great things that the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. The home is the first place to start. Now, the morning I was saved, the first person that God laid on my heart was, first of all, my stepmother, who I hated. And then there was my two brothers, who were both lost. So I made a I made an oath that day that I was going after my two brothers and Mary. Of course, I didn't really want to go after Mary, but I did want to go after my two brothers. Well, now, how how faithful was I? Twenty-three years I witnessed to my baby brother. Twenty-six years I witnessed to my oldest brother, and I was privileged to introduce him to the Lord in his home. That was a miracle of miracles. A godless man, a wealthy man, a man that didn't care about nothing but nobody but himself. He said, Cecil, I want to belong to a religion that I can go out and get drunk, commit adultery, and go in and get pay the old preacher and get forgiven. I said, well, now that's a good religion to live by, but oh, buddy, don't you die by it because you won't see heaven. Well, he started listening to Billy Graham. He, he had a, a terrible uh, sugar diabetes. 
and at midnight he couldn't sleep. And he'd listen to Billy Graham. I didn't know that. For years he listened to Billy Graham. Now, I don't know how anybody could listen to Billy Graham for years and not trust him, but he didn't. And so I had the privilege of going to his home and staying all night with him and his wife. And next morning I got up and it was just like the Lord said, this is your last chance, Cecil, to talk to your brother about Jesus. I didn't know what it meant, but it scared the liver out of me. So I got down on my knees in the bathroom and I said, Lord, I'm afraid of my brother, not physically, although I should have been. He was a big man. Uh, but I said, Lord, I can't do it. I'm afraid to. And you know what he said? Don't worry about it. I'll give you the words you want when you need them. And that's exactly what he did for me. Now, I walked out of that bathroom more and I said, Wilford Moe, I hollered at him. I said, I never tried to get you to join my church or my denomination. I never told you how to live your life. But what I was guilty of, telling you about Jesus and how he changed my life. I'm testifying now. He, you knew I was an alcoholic. You wouldn't even let me come to your home. None of you, my family, would let me come to my home, to your home. But I said, Will, would you like to trust Jesus today? And he broke down and started to cry in a big old six-foot-three giant of a man. I went on and I put my arm around him. I said, Will, let me tell you how to be saved. And I led him in a sinner's prayer. And my brother accepted Jesus, and he wept like a baby. And he said, Cecil, I... <laughs> I could feel that from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. And he was a changed man. He sobered up. Of course, he wasn't an alcoholic, but he sobered. He didn't drink anymore. See, and then, you know why he accepted Jesus that morning? Because my brother, other brother, my baby brother, who I prayed for for 23 years, was saved in the hospital. He was dying of cancer. He was saved. A chaplain led him to Christ. And when uh, Will went up to the hospital to see him that night, my brother Leland asked him to come in the room and close the door. And he said, Will, come on, take me by the hand. And so they were, my brothers were real close guys. And he said, you know, our kid brother Cecil's a preacher. And you know he's prayed for us and he's sent us literature. And he's done everything he could to tell us about Jesus. But we wouldn't do it. Now, Cecil, I'm dying. Uh, well, I'm dying. And so I gave him my heart and invited him in to forgive my sins. Will, he said, be sure and do it before you die so we can all be together in heaven. Now, I, my brother never told me that until after he was saved. I said, see, even Leland, dead now in heaven, testified of what happened in his life. That's our job. Tell your neighbor Tell your wife, tell your son, tell your daughter, tell your mother, your dad, that something happened. Do you have to preach to them? Of course not. You can say, I remember how convicted I was when I was lost, and I knew I was doomed and damned. Now you say, well, all people don't know it. Well, I don't know. You've got a, you've got a inside, you've got a, a soul, you've got a conscience. Now, let me ask you this. Do you know? that you're going to heaven if you were to die today. You say, Cecil, well, uh, I think I'm going to go, or, or I'm planning on it. That's not what I ask you. You see, you proved to me right then and there that you were lost, doomed, and damned because you don't know. But in 1 John 5, 13, this is written that you may know that you have passed from death unto life. Now, where else are we to testify? Well, in the assembly of saints. Ephesians 5.19. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing and making melody with your hearts to the Lord. Friends, if you're not happy and you're saved, you're not walking right. No, you're not walking your talk. See, when, we're, when we do sin and we, we're convicted of our sin, God tells us. Why does he convict us? Because he wants us to change our path. Now, if you're a habitual liar, God's going to tell you about that. If you're a thief, he's going to tell you about that. And he will point out the errors of our way. The reason he does it is because he loves you. 
How many times you've heard me say, well, God's not sitting up there in heaven with a ball bat, getting ready to knock your block off every time you make a mistake. That's not what he's there for. He came to seek and to save that which is lost. He loves you. He's drawing you by his Holy Spirit, even tonight. If you don't know Jesus Christ, he's drawing you with his Spirit. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I shall draw all men unto me. Now, we're supposed to testify without shame or fear. 1 Timothy 1.8, 2 Timothy 1.8. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel according to the power of God. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Paul said that many times. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. And I'm not ashamed of the gospel either. You know what? My uh, son-in-law, and I want you to pray for him real hard this coming week. And uh, uh, Moxley's his name because he's having a serious hip operation. And uh, so he and his wife, my daughter, and my wife, and my granddaughter, and her husband, and my two great-grandchildren, with over to the White, White Friends Farm, which is a chicken place. Oh, my, 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 my. I did fall off my diet for once, just a little bit. And we were talking, and we were sharing, and when it came time they brought the food, my daughter said, Dad, are you asked the blessing? And all those hundreds of people in that big auditorium, I just bowed my head and prayed. Thank the Lord for the food. Thank the Lord for my family and for my son-in-law. And I pray that, that he'll just get out of that hospital in a hurry. I keep saying, Lord, make it like a walk through the park. That's what happened to me when I had my cancer operation. If you think I wasn't afraid, you're crazy. I was afraid. You said, what? You a preacher? You doggone right I was afraid. That's serious business. But I remember the morning I went into the surgery, 5 o'clock in the morning. I said, Lord, I'm afraid. But, Father, I know you said you'd go with me, and I know you will. It's your promise. But, Lord, make this a walk through the park, you and me together. And it was the neatest operation. I didn't even take but two pain pills all the time that I was in the hospital. I was in there five days. Didn't have to take chemotherapy, thank God. But, you know, the Bible said there would be a constant readiness for an opportunity to witness. 1 Peter 3.15 But sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. Oh, friends, hear I had an opportunity that very few alcoholics ever have. I went to Seattle to find my cousin. Her and her husband both were alcoholics. She'd seen my movie, and she wept through the whole movie. But anyway, I said, I want to go down and meet the bartender who used to be a dear friend of mine, him and his wife. We went down to this big bar, and they had a great big booth there to seat about ten people. And I sat down in the booth and ordered a 7-Up. And my cousin, she brought six or seven or eight people back there to witness to. Oh, I never had such a wonderful time of my life. They were asking me questions that little children ask in Sunday school. And I told them, oh, it does work. I said, and I told them, I shared my testimony. Tell them, told them a life of misery and how I was abused by my stepmother and locked in the basement and beaten. And I told them that. And then I said, a man of God told me about Jesus Christ. And I said, I opened my heart and received him. Repenting him, I said, I said, I've been sober ever since. To God be the praise and the glory. Well, what is a testimony supposed to do? Well, it relates to personal experience. Now, I read in Psalm 66, 16, Come and hear all who fear God, and I will tell you what he has done for my soul. That's what I love to do. Oh, my. I was in Portland pastoring a church one time, or in Corbett. This woman said, I know an alcoholic. He was a roofer, just like you were. 
and he lost his home, he lost his business, he lost his wife, and he was gone for a year, and finally he missed his wife and asked her to come back. They were living in a shack, shacky old apartment house. And I went in and I sat down and I told him my whole story. And you know what he said to me, friends? He said, Cecil, I just love your story. My, he said, that's a beautiful story. I want everything that you have. But I don't want Jesus to get it. I said, you'll never have it. Friends, these the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other door into heaven. You say, I'm a Catholic. Don't make a difference. You say, you're a Presbyterian, a Baptist, a Pentecost. Don't make any difference what you call yourself. Have you repented? Have you cried out, God, be merciful to sin? If you have, you are now born again. Your name is written in the Lamb Book of Life. Now let's get busy. Get into God's holy word. Tell people what Jesus did for you. Now, a testimony of what it does, it recounts God's blessing. Isaiah 63, 7. I shall make mention of the loving kindness of the Lord, the praises of the Lord, according to all that the Lord has granted us, and the great goodness toward the house of Israel, which he has granted to them according to his compassion, and according to the multitude of his loving kindness. That's what you're doing. You're recounting the blessings. Now, Okay, you say, see, so hold it back up a little bit here. I just lost my house, or I just lost my husband or my wife or my children. I'm almost penniless. I'm a Christian. What should I do? Stick with Jesus. Tell him what happened. Tell him how you feel. Tell him how you hurt. Ask him what you need according to his will, and you'll do it. He'll do it for you, according to his will. Now, sometimes we ask things that's not good for us, and it would hurt us and hurt our walk with the Lord. But if it's according to God's will, he'll give it to you. Now, in Malachi 3.16, Then those who feared the Lord spoke to one another, and the Lord gave attention and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear the Lord and who esteem his name. It's an everyday duty that you share Jesus. You don't have to go in. You know what? I can share my testimony in two minutes. I've done it in restaurants. And I've led people to Christ in restaurants and on airplanes and num num numerous places. Am I a big shot soul winner? No. No, I'm not. But, oh, beloved, I can remember that night so many years ago when I lost everything I had, my family, my business, our home. I was penniless. I was bankrupt. And now my wife said, I, I'm going to have to leave because I can't put up with your lying anymore. And that night I went to a pastor's home who told me what my problem was. And gave me the answer. And I responded. And I received Christ. And I've been sober ever since. To God be the glory and the praise and the honor. Jesus did it. Don't Cecil didn't do it. You say, well, Cecil, let me tell you what. I wasn't an alcoholic. You don't have to be. But having the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believe, therefore I spoke. We also believe, there also we speak. Friends, listen. I gotta close this thing out tonight, but I wouldn't want to close this if I didn't ask you. Would you like to know Jesus? You say, Cecil, of course I would, but I belong to a church. Oh, friend, that's not going to get you into heaven. Jesus said you must be born again, born twice, physically and then spiritually. Now tonight, if the God's Holy Spirit is tugging at your heart, and I know He is, if you if you're listening this long, you you've been saying. Well, maybe, maybe Cecil's right. Well, the Bible's right. I know he changed my life. So you say, well, Cecil, I tell you what, I got that tug. Now what do I do? Bow your head at me right now and pray this powerful, powerful prayer. Dear Lord, I confess that I'm a sinner, and Lord, I'm so sorry for my life. I've been such a mistake. But tonight, Lord, the best way I know how I'm opening my heart and inviting you in to be my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Friend, if you prayed that prayer, you get on the phone and you call 303-471-8534. No, I won't use your name on the air. No, I won't embarrass you. 
I want to sit down right now and ask you a friend of mine, don't care where you go to church. Only I'm concerned where you spend eternity. And if you can't afford to call, call me collect. I'll accept that call. I'm waiting right now by my phone. I'm waiting for you to call me. And I'll tell you the greatest story ever told a man. For God so loved Cecil Mole that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him should not perish but have eternal life. Oh, give me a call. I'm waiting right now. friends for the past half hour your host has been evangelist Cecil Mo. thank you dear ones for listening and oh I pray that it touched somebody's heart and life if you are confused and you want to talk to some preacher it won't cost you a dime I won't jump on you I won't tear you up I'll answer the question the best way I know how and if I don't know the answer I'll have it for you in just a short time well friends continue to pray for our health Pray that God will get rid of this pneumonia completely out of my system and, and the, I got some infection too and get rid of that so I can get well and get back out in the highways and the byways telling them about Jesus. Testify every opportunity you get. You'll be blessed for it. Well, friends, until this time next Sunday night, I want you to be good to your neighbors. Stay sweet. Keep looking up for this wonderful, wonderful Jesus is coming soon. Good night and may God bless you. Real, real good. <laughs>